it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I love you, brother. Um, I'm excited that I get to share my testimony today. Uh, testimonies are a powerful thing, right? The Bible says that's one of the ways that we overcome the devil, man. And I'm extremely optimistic when it comes to this prophetic hour we're living in. Like, I understand it's going to get worse before it gets better, but I don't feel the need to have to run or hide or hope that I get raptured out of here. Because when I view the book of Revelation, I view it as the church overcomes, man. It's like explicit. This is how they overcame the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death, man. So I think it's awesome, bro, that you're starting to do some testimony shows, and I'm really, really lucky that you asked me to share my testimony. Um, very glad you uh, came on. Uh, the the whole uh, title of the, the program, as we, you know, I told you before, is uh, Martyria Time, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. I'm probably butchering the, the Latin, or I mean, excuse me, the yeah, Greek. But uh, anyway, it's uh, based on the, the Greek word for testimony from the Book of Revelations. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how the laying down of the life and the testimony are basically the same thing, right? And I think there's a reason for that because, like, today I'm going to share my testimony of how Christ basically took my life from me. But he gave me a better one in return. And right. because of that, he's super worthy. Like, no matter what happens in these next coming years, man, he's worthy of every single thing he'll lead me into, even if that's a guillotine or a Kabbalistic sword my friend. Um, so, like, I'll start my testimony like this. Uh, I grew up in a very, very small, small farming community in Minnesota. Uh, there were probably, like, 200 people that lived in the whole town. And the reason I was there was because my dad was a minister. And he had two churches in Minnesota about, like, 20 miles or 30 miles apart from each other. The interesting thing was I learned a lot about just how to love people, man. Like, to say that this was like Little House on the Prairie sort of environment growing up would be probably pretty accurate. Because, like, it was a small-knit farming community, like, a lot of the schooling we got was, like, a mixture of homeschool, and then we actually went to a a church that, or uh, not a church, a school that was like literally like Little House on the Prairie, man, where all the grades were kind of in one classroom. And I learned to read basically because my dad taught me how to read and he taught me how to ring, read out of a King James Version Bible. And he was one of those old school ministers who believed in disciplining your children, who believed in right and wrong. Um, but he definitely believed in love. He was the type of person that would pick up hitchhikers in the middle of winter, give them the, the coat off his back. I mean, we didn't have two pennies to rub together. We would, we would basically, the people in the farming community had no money to give us. They'd give us like 
potatoes that give us eggs, milk, all that stuff, man. Like some some lunches would be mashed potatoes and then dinner would be potato skins, you know? Like, but my dad, he just didn't care. He loved people. He loved people, man. And that's what I remember the most about him. I also remember growing up in a church where it was basically all I knew. Like, I wanted to be a minister ever since I was a young little kid. Because I would just follow around my dad everywhere that he went. But the weird thing about my uh, church, where we were a very conservative uh, branch of Lutheranism, and I'm not, not a Lutheran anymore. I have some very, very sharp disagreements with the Reformation movement and the way that they treated the Sermon on the Mount and Anabaptists. Um, but my dad really, really, really was into the denomination that that we grew up in, and this was like a no-nonsense denomination. Like, yeah. like the, the Bible was the King James Version Bible. Like, when they wanted to adopt the NIV, like, a civil war started in our denomination over it, man. Like, we had a red hymnal that hadn't changed. Like, they, like, when they wanted to put amazing grace into the hymnal, that almost destroyed the denomination. Because we felt that was too emotional of a song, you know? And, like, so the hymnal I grew up in didn't have Amazing Grace in it because it was too emotional, you know? And that's the way it was. Like, we based God on this, like, can't get emotional. It's very dry. It's very dead. Like, it's organ music. And that doesn't mean that people that believe that are dead inside. It's just that they re they they approach God in a very uh, formula formulaic means like they know all the ins and outs of scripture like but what they are missing is that power within right my dad died when i was like nine years old and uh we couldn't you know like he died basically because there was no health health uh, insurance when you live in a farm community like that dieting is like based on high cholesterol food, right? And my dad would run around and he would push himself to churches. Just he was always on the go. His health just failed him and he died. And um, it was crazy. He was, I remember just being nine years old and my dad was the closest person in the world to me. Like, I didn't know much about God, but I knew everything about my dad, you know? And um, people would tell me, well, hey, uh, your dad's in heaven. And I'm like, I know that. And I'm like, but why is he in heaven? You know, like, I don't understand. And they're like, well, God needed him in heaven. That's what they kept telling me. God needed him. He needed him in heaven. And I got really upset. I was like, well, guess what? If God is all powerful and heaven is this awesome place, like why does he need my dad? I need my dad, you know? Like who is this God that that takes loved ones from you when you need them the most? But I trusted it because I trusted my dad. And so I grew up and at around the age of twelve, I was like, I believe in eighth grade. And I and I was like in our denomination, it, you, to become a pastor, an ordained pastor, is a very, very uh, regulated thing, right? Like, you pretty much have to go to the denomination's the college, then the seminary, then do um, uh, vicarships and all kinds of stuff. It's a super long process. And for most people, it starts in high school. They have a preparatory school that's attached to the campus of the college. And so I was like, I really want to go to this preparatory school. I want to be a minister. And so my mom scrimped and saved and sent me to this expensive, basically, boarding school. It was like, I was 13 now. Lived, I was completely on my own. Um, I live living about like 50, 60 miles away from home, having to do my own laundry, having to 
you know, basically navigate life. And I didn't fit in, man. Like, most of the people there came from money. I came from nothing, you know? And everything was super clicky, and, you know, there was a lot of hazing that was going on. Uh, the pastors were just... It was a pretty crazy environment, man. Um, and I just didn't... I got... I just didn't see the love of Jesus. Like, my... My desire to be a pastor at that point kind of just went out the window, man. And uh, there was one kid there who had a twin brother who lived off campus and went to the town high school. And I became friends with him. And then through him, I started meeting all the kids that were in town. And we just started uh, just doing stupid stuff that kids do, you know, smoking, uh, drinking here and there. Uh, just dumb stuff, right? I got a girlfriend. Um, it was kind of crazy. But in the meantime, I'm still having to do this religious work, right? And uh, since this uh, is not only the college, the main college in our denomination, but the preparatory high school too, they have just like this huge library system. And they have this huge, huge, like, underground thing that they called the stacks. And it was something, like, straight out of, like, a horror movie, right? Where you go down there and you can't take books out because they're super old. Uh, you can only photocopy them. Like, it's just creepy, man. Low light. It, like, it literally gives you the chills when you're down there, man. And I had to do an assignment on, like, original sin or something like that in the Garden of Eden. And, like, when you're Lutheran and you have to put together a paper, you have to be able to establish two things. What does the Bible say and what does Martin Luther say about it, right? And a lot of times it's the second one that's the most important. And I don't understand that, but, you know, you got you to gotta do it. So I went down there and I'm trying to find something about Satan and sin, and I came across this really, really crazy old book that was on Satanism and witchcraft, and it had these stories of all these people who, like, made deals with the devil or were possessed by the devil. It was doing all this crazy stuff, man, and I'm reading this, and I'm like, how come the devil gets to do miracles? How come the devil has this power? Like, we were cessationists. We believed that that stuff all ended at the book of Acts. Like, and if you prayed, well, it was a, a lottery. You know, like, maybe God will answer and maybe he won't. Maybe he'll show up and do something. Maybe he won't. That whole anointing with oil and the prayer of faith, maybe that works, maybe that doesn't. And I remember sitting there just reading stories of people who had given their life to Satan, who Satan just came through in the clutch for him, basically. And it kind of creeped me out. And, like, nothing crazy happened in this weird environment. It just was like it impacted me in a way that I didn't know. And it was just something that Satan planted into my heart. And uh, things went really crazy at this school. I got expelled my freshman year. Um Drinking, smoking, sneaking out, breaking curfew, fighting with people. Uh, I just basically was out of control, man. I just, I hadn't, I was that kid that you don't put on, your, put on his own at that sort of age, man. And I remember uh, getting really, really wasted one night and waking up the next morning. And my girlfriend had pierced my ear. Um, I don't remember how she did it. She said she used like an Iron Maiden pin off my jacket and she put in, she, she had these like really awesome dangling cross earrings. And you got to remember, this is the eighties. This is the hair metal when you had the long hair and you wore the earrings and you know, it was all about the glam rock and all this other stuff. And so it was, it was cool to have the long earring as long as it was in the correct ear. Because if you put it in the wrong ear, then that said something negative about your sexuality, right? So 
she put it in the wrong ear first of all because <laughs> she was also wasted and it oh it got infected it was bad right but the worst part was go back to the the dorm and i come in my ears all puffed up it's pussy like it's just it's infected and and it's this cross earring and the the pastor, because like the dean and the all the people that are in control that live there are pastor. The pastor comes in and he's like, You gotta remove that earring. And I said, Why? Why do I have to remove the earring? And he's like, Because it's not Christian. And I'm like, Okay. Why is why is wearing a cross in your ear not Christian? And I wasn't trying to be you know, I can see why he would say it. You know, you got to have rules, and and I get that, and man, but I just honestly, I didn't know why I couldn't. And I'm like, hey man, my girlfriend gave this to me. Like, I'm not taking it out. And he's like, you're gonna take it out, or I'm gonna rip it out. And I just looked at him, and I'm like, yeah. So you're gonna lecture me about uh, being Christian, and you're gonna perpetrate violence on a youth. Neat. And it was at that point I was just like, shine all this religious garbage. And within a month later, I was expelled. And usually you don't get expelled from preacher school when you're, when you're a freshman in high school, but I managed to get that done. And then I just went to high school, and I found a whole new group of friends, man. Uh, a bunch of uh, metalheads. Uh, a bunch of punk rockers with, you know, the Mohawks and the colored hair and all the, man, my friend groups ran a gamut of crazy people. There were some people that were thrash metal ads. Some of them were skate punks. Some of them were like, uh, well, you wouldn't call them emo kids, but they listened to The Cure. And I don't even know if they were necessarily goth, maybe. Like Susie and the Banshees and uh, Brujas and things like that. Um, then I had friends who listened to Winger and Poison, you know? Um, I was kind of a striper guy myself, but I, I liked punk rock music too and the thrash metal. Um, I had friends who were uh, into the punk scene that were into bands like Screwdriver, which were neo Nazi skinhead bands. Um, they wore certain color, uh, certain color laces in their boots. That's all I'll say about that. Um, so I, I hung out with just like a crazy, crazy group of people, man. And I found a lot of acceptance in it. I uh, learned how to uh, play a little bass. I did a little singing in a punk band. Um, had a best friend at the time who was amazingly cool. Um. We did everything together. Like, man, we were, we were thick as thieves, dude. And uh, we started uh, just peddling drugs on the side. Uh, just just being stupid, right? And I remember one day I came home, and I was really, really, really mad at my friend because we were supposed to sell pot to a bunch of jocks on the football team because even though like the jocks hated our crowd back then like we were good enough to get them dope so they could have their friday night parties after the games right so and they would never invite us to the parties but at least we could make money off of selling them some weed and whatnot and so it was always a dicey situation to go into that environment you know because Class warfare was real in the 80s in high school, man. And uh, my friend was supposed to be my backup. And uh, he wasn't there, and I had to make the deal all by myself. And, you know, you're surrounded by 10 jocks, and you're just that one dude. And it's like, man, are they going to rip me off? You know, are they just going to throw me in a locker and take all my dope? You know what I'm saying? And then I'm out a bunch of money. Uh, so I was mad. So then I, I was like, oh, shenanigans. So... I went from my house to my friend's house, and I was all ready to yell and scream at him about how dumb it was.
because like i'm like this is you put in part of the money for this dope too sir like you could have gotten ripped off too and i got in there and my my friend was bruised he was beaten uh this dude was three times tougher than i was this dude could probably fight 10 men and 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 not even break a sweat i mean he was just the toughest dude uh he i once saw him take his baseball hat off and swing it and catch a bird flying by him out of the air seriously i mean this dude was like some sort of ninja almost man and he looked like he got the living crap kicked out of him and i stopped dead in my track and i was like whoa what happened and he basically said my stepdad did this to me last night and i said what and he's like i went I, I needed a cigarette i went in my stepdad's bedroom i stole a cigarette came smoked it went back to bed so in the middle of the night i got woken up by my stepdad he had a switchblade to my throat and said why are you stealing from me he was drunk and he beat the holy heck out of me and like that was the one dude he who he couldn't fight back with you know because if if he would they'd just throw him and his mom out on the street you know and it was bad dude and he was angry he was so angry and i remember just being shell shocked because i'm like this dude is the dude who taught me to fight you know and like this guy here he's in this bad state and so we went up to uh, his room and he was like man i wish i could do this 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 and this to my stepdad but i can't and he really didn't know what to do and i'm telling you man i personally believe in the power of sowing seeds and i'm not talking about a financial thing like benny hinn or joel Osteen here but i believe every time you share the gospel every time you witness to someone anytime you put out a bible track anytime you pray for someone anytime you encourage someone you're sowing the gospel into people's lives it never returns void but satan also knows this concept and concept and he will sow things into your life over a period of years man and things that you don't necessarily remember are there and i don't know why it happened and i don't know why it came to my mind but in that moment man honestly i just remember sitting in the stacks and this was two years later man and all of these stories of how these people asked satan to work on their behalf and it just it just that seed just hit my mind man and i don't even remember why i said it but i said hey man let's ask satan to help us because i had friends who were satanists i had friends who were agnostic i had friends who were atheists i even had a couple friends who claimed to be christian metalheads you know um and my friend was like how are we gonna ask satan that ain't gonna work and i'm like well let's uh let's let's uh get in a ouija board let's ask let's ask satan let's try to communicate with them because i didn't know how to pray to satan you know um i knew how to pray to god but i didn't know how to pray to satan and all i remember was a story about someone who uh was doing the ouija board and the ouija board movies were really popular back then like which board and all these movies and i'm just like yeah let's 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 do a ouija board and he's like Bro, where are we gonna get a Ouija board? You know, we like go down to Walmart and buy one because you can buy them in the stores, right? And I'm like, no, 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 it's got to be real. It's got to be real if we do it. I, let's make our own Ouija board, and let's decorate it, and let's let's put blood on it. Let's show Satan we're serious, man. So we made our own Ouija board out of cardboard. We had some uh, luminescent glow-in-the-dark tape that was popular back then. We put that. On the corners, we drew some pentagrams. We like we we decked it out like as as best as we thought us amateur our armchair satanists. You know, like we we didn't know what we were doing, man. And the important thing was the we each we each uh, cut ourselves, and uh, 
Now you won't see it on the camera, but if, if you were here, you could see it's right here. I, I still have the scar, man. Um, I cut myself, he cut himself, and uh, we put the blood on the, the Ouija board on each four corners, and we made a triangle planeteer out of some cardboard. We put blood on all three corners of that, and we prayed to Satan. And we dedicated the board to Satan, and we asked Satan to, to help us. And we did the whole, like, moving the Ouija board around, and it, you know, we didn't know if we were doing it ourselves, if it was, you know, we, we both had our eyes closed, and we were hoping and trusting. We may have been a tad bit high, <laughs> you know, um, but it spelled out the word black, cat, then a date, like, uh, like just number of a date, and then a time. And, uh, well, it was like a seven or something. It, we learned out that it was a time. And uh, we wrote it down. We wrote it down on the back of the board. And uh, we were like, did it work? We don't know. We placed it in his dresser. And we went downstairs and we got a little more baked. And we didn't think much about it. Um, about a couple weeks later, uh, my friend's mom was a cat lady. And, y you know, you know the type of lady who's a cat lady, but, like, she wasn't allowed to have inside cats because this stepdad was a real control freak. But this lady's always been a cat lady. So in order not to, like, have cats on the inside, she would feed stray neighborhood cats on the outside, right? And then, like, she'd always have all these cats hanging around. Well, one night, me and my friend were chilling, and we heard a commotion, like a ruckus, a royal ruckus going on downstairs. So we started walking down the steps, and we saw the stepdad trying to chase a cat that got in one of the cats that she was feeding when the stray cats got into the house it was a black cat and man this cat was like the bruce lee of cats dude like it was flying around it was scratching him left and right like like this dude stood no chance man uh he was bleeding he was like oh, it was bad dude bites like all like you could like for weeks you could see the scratch marks on this dude's face his arms his hands like he just got tore up real real bad like he may have marked up my friend but i guarantee this cat did twice the number on him and the cat finally gets put out and i'm sitting there and i'm just like wow that's awesome dude but i didn't even put it in put it two and two together because I looked around and I, I wanted to, I remember wanting to see the look on my friend's face. I wanted to see, cause like, this is like, ha ha, you get yours, sir. Can come up and like, I don't believe in karma, but maybe young BDK did. And that would have been karma. Right. And I'm looking for my friend and I can't find him. So I go up to his room and I remember this. I can see this. I can even smell the way the room smelled because he, he used to burn some sort of crazy incense always up there. And I just remember him sitting on his bed, his back up against the headboard, like almost Indian style. And he's holding this cardboard Ouija board like this. And he's actually shaking. Um, it's crazy. And and I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, he flips the board over. And he's like, look at what we wrote. Black cat. I'm like, what's the date? We didn't have iPhones and smartwatches. <laughs> we actually had a look on a calendar, uh, but it was the date. And then I looked at the clock, and I'm like, this happened when? And then we just counted back the 15 minutes and we were like bro how did that happen now like i don't know 
if the devil has the power to predict the future, but I know that he can align circumstances. And we know from the Bible that the devil can possess animals. We know that God's angels can possess donkeys. Like, we know this happens. And it's nothing for Satan to have one of his demonic minions stage something like this, you know? I didn't know that at the time. All I knew is that I had been praying to a God who took my dad from me since I was nine years old, and I never saw one miracle. I never saw any power. I never saw anything that this church had been teaching me ever come to truth. I didn't feel any sort of love in the religion, only fear. I believed that the religion was fake, but I asked the devil for one favor once, and he answered me, and he showed himself to me. And like I said, man, ever since I was a young kid, man, I've been obsessed with the spiritual. And man, if, 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 uh, if fallen angels were evangelists and they were preaching a message that night, it was like Satan gave an altar call to me in that room and I accepted Satan as my Lord and Savior. And I remember just being like, I don't, I don't know who you are other than what they've told me growing up in my Christian religion that you're the bad guy. Some of my Satanist friends who, because at the time, the Alistair, uh, not Alistair Crowley, uh, Anton LaVey, the Satanist book, was really, really popular because, you know, it was the 80s, like Ozzy Osbourne, Motley Crue, like everybody wanted to shout at the devil, right? And uh, they, they assured me, no, you don't understand, Satan's the good guy. He's the good guy. It was God that wanted to hold people in slavery. Satan was the one who risked everything to to truly bring us into a path of enlightenment. And I'm like, well, I don't know about that. And they're like, they're like, look, man, Satan might not even be real. Maybe he's just a mythos. Maybe you are God, you know? Maybe that's what Satanism represents. And so I remember just the walking out of that room being like, I don't, I don't know anything about you, Satan, except for what they told me, but man, I'm going to find out and I'm going to serve you. And uh, man, I, I started reading the Satanic Bible. I read that in a day. So this is not really big. And uh, I was like, I am my own God. Like, they tell me to turn the other cheek. No, no animal turns the other cheek. Like, they tell me not to uh, be lustful. No, no, no. Satanism teaches I am an animal. Like, I, I, I can be lustful. Like, why is Jehovah trying to chain me down? And like that satanic uh bible which was basically humanism cloaked in satanism led me into reading alistair crowley one of my friends who was a satanist said man no no you don't understand the only thing that that uh this book teaches that's really truly true is that you do what you want you are your own god but here's this book do what thou wills the whole of the law start there and i started investigating alistair crowley and then i started investigating some of the more spiritual uh, spell casting. Um, I mixed a little bit of Wicca in with it. Uh, my friend was also into the Satanism, but he got more into like a, a Nazi version of it. Um, I just, I anything, man, that I could consume, I would consume. It was like, you know how Christians listen to Christian music? I listened to nothing but like heavy thrash metal like Venom and Slayer. Like I started taking drugs now not to get high but to have experiences. Like I didn't want I didn't want to take uh pot unless it was laced with something that would that would consciousness. I was taking LST, I was taking shrooms, I was doing things just to open myself up just to have spiritual experiences, man. Like, and my room was like a temple, dude. Like I had the walls covered in like satanic imagery, thrash bands, 
um just everything really really weird man i'd burn incense uh i shared a room with my younger brother who was nine years younger than me so he was only like six or seven or something like that man and it, my room was bad dude my room was like six seven degrees colder than the rest of the house even with the heat turned down like i would have nightmares in this room my younger brother wouldn't even sleep in it you know, like we had a bunk bed and he was never there because he just it was so creepy you could tangibly feel the presence of evil in that room man he would sleep either on the couch downstairs and then at one point he actually set up a little pup tent in the basement and slept down there he just, he, he just couldn't handle being in that room man and it got bad dude because like when you open up your mind to all of this stuff and you believe that you're god and you start believing that all rules and all societal constraints are just illusions of mechanisms of control and that if you want to do something you do it because morality is an illusion and then furthermore you're empowered to do it by satan and and i was seeing like well obviously because i was under drugs and stuff i was seeing all this kind of crazy stuff and man i had zero moral code life meant nothing to me man like i was getting in fights because i didn't care like one time i was sitting in a math class talking to one of my skate punk friends and some kid behind me said dude please be quiet i'm trying to learn and i said what'd you say to me and he's like please be quiet I i'm trying to learn reasonable request man no i'm like you don't understand son that's not what we do here i got up threw the desk over picked this dude up started beating the daylights out of him just because he asked me to be quiet this was like and the teacher oh my goodness i felt so bad for her because this was her first year teaching right and she was freaking out like we didn't have campus security we didn't have metal detectors back then like we had a janitor try to covet and try to like restrain me with a bandana you know and that didn't go over well and then the cops were called and it was bad dude it was really bad like we uh we were dissecting pigs i thought it'd be funny to uh cut the head off the pig and we used to have like those giant bottles of ketchup that would pump right and it'd be that number five can or whatever it was i thought it'd be funny to put severed pig's heads in all the ketchup so that people would find them later and none of this stuff that i did man even registered to me because i had no moral right or wrong code and i was in a very dangerous place i was scary people just didn't want to be around me anymore because i was just wild dude i was demonic you know um interesting story by the way uh my brother went to the same school like seven years later or whatever it was and that teacher who had me during that incident um remembered me and remembered my last name because it was such a just crazy thing that happened and when she on the first day of school my younger brother said his name and she was like oh are you related to so and so and he was like yeah that's my older brother and her words were i'm sorry is he in jail <laughs> <laughs> and my brother looks at her and says, actually, he, he's a pastor. Because <laughs> I was a pastor by then. And I guess that flipped her out, man. Um, but I, I just got crazy, dude. I just, I had lost all sense of reality, man. And uh, it got so, so bad that my best friend, who I got into all this trouble with to begin with, man. Uh, he was like for a week straight, he's just like, bro, you got to calm down, stop taking drugs. Like you got to do something, man. Cause you're, you're going insane, dude, going insane. And he's like, he's trying to talk me out of this. And I'm like, you just don't understand, man. Like you don't understand. Like I'm trying to do something. I'm on the, the path to Godhood, man. Like, my enemies fear me because I am to be feared, you know? Like, what they said was crazy was just the, the 
was just natural selection and chaos, man. And uh, I remember just uh, being in class one day. I look over. The principal's there. The janitor guy is there. And there's a cop there. And we had someone called an AODA, which was a, a drug counselor. The school had a drug counselor that they would send you to. And they had little support groups in the school. And he was there. And I looked over, and I'm like, that's not good. And I knew who they were coming for. There were drugs in my locker. Heck, yeah, there were drugs in my locker. Like, I wasn't selling drugs out of my locker at that point. Those were just my personal drugs. Um, and they, they're like, hey, come, come out here. We start walking towards my walker or my locker, and I'm just like, well, it is what it is, man, you know? And I get there, and there's my friend. He's standing at the locker. And I'm like, oh, shoot, they've got him too, you know? Because his locker was only a couple of lockers down from mine because we have uh, both of our last names start with the same letter. Um, I thought they had, they had swept him up too. But in reality, he dropped the dime on me. He's the one that narked me out. Told everyone that there were drugs in my locker. They opened up the locker. Sure enough, drugs. Like, if there would have been any sort of scales or any sort of uh, paraphernalia, like extra baggies or anything like that, I would have been busted on distributing. But since it was just like a bag of drugs that was obviously personal in nature, I got lucky. Because, like, sometimes... You know how they can they can do you any little excuse, right? Um, I got really lucky though, man. I didn't have any of the paraphernalia. I didn't have I didn't in there, man. I was just just drugs. And uh, they took me to the office. They said they were gonna charge me, and the AODA was like, I, you know, like if you're willing to go to rehab, if you're willing to go to rehab and get help then then you know we'll confiscate the drugs maybe just a misdemeanor like you're young they probably won't even stay on your record just but if if you if you want to do this on your own man then you can just go to court and deal with it and i'm just like oh i don't want to go to juvie and i don't want to go to jail and i don't want to go to court uh i'll just plead this thing and go to rehab and so i ended up pleading it and going to rehab man and Rehab was a crazy, crazy place because I was like halfway through my junior year, I believe. And I've been doing drugs now for like pretty much every day since my sophomore year. And heavy drug use and just all this crazy stuff. And man, I'll tell you, I don't think there was ever a day where I wasn't drinking or doing drugs. And it's crazy because, like, you never feel that that messes with you until you can't do it. Like, you have to drink a certain amount and you have to do a certain amount of drugs just to be normal, right? To, to have a level balancing field. And you never realize how bad it is until, like, you're sitting in a room in a rehab and you can't even have a cigarette. You know, and you start drinking water, but your mouth is so dry, your tongue is stuck to your roof of your your uh, mouth and then you realize that man i was addicted and i did not handle that i mean i lost my mind and if i was insane before then like they had a room you know the room with the padded walls where they put you because you know you need to work your stuff out but like, i would just sit there and just punch the walls until my knuckles bled and then they'd come in and they'd be like can't do that and they restrain you with the can only restrain you for so long and i mean it was really bad and i remember being in rehab for like two three months and uh it was hell like as a preacher i've often said that 
all the sermons I've ever preached about heaven and hell and trying to wake people up to the reality of hell and what hell will be like if you go there. I would have loved to, to have been able to just take a person that I'm preaching to you and put them in my shoes for those three months and say, that's going to be your first minute in hell. And then I could take an altar call. You know what I'm saying? Um, I did not want to go back. Like once I got all the drugs out of my system, once I had kind of a, a good frame of mind, I didn't, it's not that I didn't enjoy doing drugs. It's not that I didn't still believe a bunch of that stuff. It's just that I did not want to go through that withdrawals again. I did not want to go through the rehab process again. I didn't want to deal with all that pain, with all that hurt, with all that drama. And so I walked out of there uh, determined in my heart never, ever to touch drugs or drink again. Because I just didn't want to go through it. Uh, like, I just didn't want to. I couldn't, like, I, oh, man, it was bad. But the thing that, that messed me up was yeah. none of that. They, you know, I was going through the 12-step program. I was going through, I, I went to meetings. Man, I went to meetings. I was working the program. I went to Alcoholics Anonymous on one night. And then another night I would go to NA. And I had a collection of chips. And everyone was like, you got to turn it over to that higher power. My higher power was that still that very new ages, I am God sort of ideal. And, uh. I was getting really, really depressed. It was really easy to be straight in rehab once the drugs wear off. But like when you're back out and all your friends are still doing stuff and you know, you're back trying to be straight in the real world, it's really, it's really hard. And I was really depressed and I was really suicidal because all those demons that promised me power and godhood and enlightenment and miracles and whatnot they knew i was slipping away from their grasp and they were just like no man we got what we wanted out of them let's just take this dude out before things get crazy and i think the reason they were doing that was because people were praying for me my mom was praying for me i would hear my mom crying in the next room sometimes weeping god Please bring him back. I remember my mom, I remember hearing my mom cry to God and say uh, the name of her husband, which was my dad. Because my, my dad, every single night, he would come into my sister's room and my room, and uh, we would have to kneel beside our bed, and we would have to say our prayers. He would do it individually. We'd, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. And then we'd have to say some prayers for some people. And then we'd do an Our Father at the end. But then at the end of every prayer, he would place his hands on the back of my head or my sister. He was in her room. And all the formula prayers would stop. And he would just place his hands on the back of our head. God, I give you I give you my firstborn son. Use him. Use him in ministry. Keep him. Bless him. And he would pray. That that inheritance type prayer, man. And he wasn't like, and trust me, he wasn't a word of faith guy. But uh, he would pray that over me every single night. And I believe those prayers count, man. There's no time limit on that stuff. And I remember, and then, you know, like, in all the craziness, I had forgotten. I had forgotten that that stuff was prayed over me. Until one night I heard my mom just crying out to God. Like, you promised God. Like, all those prayers my husband prayed, he did not pray those in vain. 
Because, you know, he wasn't praying for my, you know, he wasn't praying for the dead to intercede on me or any sort of Catholic stuff. He, they just stand in on the promises that were prayed, you know. And I remember that just hitting me, and it, it, it brought me back to this point where maybe I did have a destiny that was real. Maybe I just didn't understand. Like, maybe I didn't understand about God. Like, I wanted to reach out to God. I remember my mom telling me point blank that I needed to start going back to church, that I needed to give my life to Jesus, that I needed to, to trust him, that I needed to repent and, and turn away from all this Satanist stuff and all this garbage that I was doing. Now that I'm clean, she's like, now's the time to do it. And I just remember looking at her with just so much honesty and saying, I can't. I sold my soul to the devil. You do not know that. And she just looked at me like horrified, like you did what? And I said, I sold my soul to the devil. I made a blood oath to the devil. I said, I can't, my soul doesn't, I can't, it's, it's gone. He owns it. I said, I said, like half my friends are Nazi skinhead punks. Jesus was a Jew. How's he going to forgive me? And I wasn't being mean or rebellious, but it broke my heart to say that because it's what I honestly believe, sir. I believe That's that even if I wanted, it's it. Yeah, exactly, man. And Satan is the father of lives. I just didn't know it. And uh, I walked away thinking, man, if there was ever... And I, and I tried praying. I said, God, if, if there's any way that, that you could somehow give me back my soul or somehow make this right, like, please, please, please help me. And I remember praying that. This was right at the beginning of my senior year. And I had like an like a English class that I was in, it was like a English lit class or something like that. Um, and I remember that we would always do group assignments and nobody ever wanted to be my group partner because sometimes I could show up to school and sometimes I wouldn't, you know, truancy was also a thing that I had working against me. Um, and I had a reputation, you know, like, Still. And I remember uh, this, this young, really awesome looking girl walks into the class. She's transferred. And uh, came to find out that like this girl is a straight A student. She's never gotten anything less than an A minus. You know what I'm saying? Like she's on the honor society. She's like the editor of the yearbook. She's in French club, she's just, she's smart, but she's not really good at writing. So creative writing is not her thing. Um, she can take a test, but she can't write poetry, you know? So she wasn't doing good in her class, so she dropped it and they gave her English Lit because there was an opening. And she walks into my classroom and she got stuck with me. Uh, because no one else would be my partner, man. And it's weird how God works because now I had to uh, do an assignment with this girl, and I knew her reputation. She knew mine, and I knew she was a Jesus freak. I knew that uh, she had friends that were Christian. They had a program called Time Out, which was the government actually, if you're not if you're in a uh, public school, they have to allow you at least one hour a week for religious instruction, as long as it's off campus. And so we had one of those programs where just down the street there was a there was an evangelical free church, and in the basement of that evangelical free church, they'd they'd, they'd have punch and cookies, and you get out of school for a week or an hour a week, and you go hear about Jesus, man. And uh, it sounded like a good thing because, like, who doesn't want to, you know, get out of school for an hour a week? But I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's a cult. You know, there's like, that's that's David Crush stuff going on over there, man. Although we didn't know who David Crush was at the time. 
Um, but she was part of that whole group. She knew the person who was running that thing. Of I was like, this chick's a Jesus freak, man. And uh, she knew my reputation, too. The whole school did. She knew I was playing for the other team, man. And so I figured that this would be really, really crazy. And I remember uh, one one afternoon, she came up and she actually sat down by me at lunch and ate lunch with me, which was crazy because you, you know how high school was back then. Those those are those are like zones. Those are countries, man. Unless you find a Switzerland table somewhere, and that that means something, you know. And uh, she was sitting down with me, and I'm like, whoa. And she just came over to me. She's like, Is it true that you did this, 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 this? Is it true you were in rehab? Is it true that you did this, that, and the other thing? And I said, Yeah. And she's like, You're a really good writer, and a really good speaker. Um. She's like, I can't can't believe that you did all this. You don't look like you're high. And I'm like, well, I'm like, it's because I go to narc. <laughs> like, I go to meetings four times a week. <laughs> you know, like I'm no, I'm not, I'm no longer hanging out doing bad stuff. Like, I'm in church basements and fellowship halls, drinking really crappy coffee, <laughs> and and stale donuts and cheat and a uh, bunt cake. <laughs> like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work the program because it works if you work it. You know. And she's like, you just, you don't seem to be who everyone is saying that you are. And she's like, hey, would you, would you want to come to the timeout program with me? And I said, nope. <laughs> I said, no, no, uh, you don't. Uh, you, first of all, you don't want me walking in that place. I'll probably start the church on fire just by via there. But I'll be like, no, man, I spend all... No, like I go to AA and NA all the time, man. No, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And she's like, I understand that. But would you be offended if I prayed for you? If me and my friends at least prayed for you? And I'm like, you're gonna pray for me? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, don't pray for me here. And she's like, no, no, I won't embarrass you. And she's like, I just want you to know that that we're praying for you. And then her her Christian Bible Club friends, when they'd see me in the hall, they'd come up to me as if they knew me now, you know. And they'd be like, hey, we just want you to know we're praying for you. And I'm like, okay, all right. Um, and the crazy thing was we were done with the group assignment within a week. I, this chick never had to talk to me again. But she did. She would call me up. And she would talk to me. And I would ask her questions about Jesus. And she would say things that would blow my mind because she was Pentecostal. Uh, she went to a, a little uh, Assembly of God church, right? One of the old school classical ones. Back then, there was no Brownsville revival or uh, Word of Faith uh, seeping into it. Like, they were pretty straight laced, man. And at least the one that, that she was going to was. Like, there was nothing done out of order. Like, it was crazy. Um, but she uh, she would just talk to me about, about God and Jesus. And she's like, you need the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, I thought they were all. And she's like, no, no, they're, they're different. Like, this is how this works. This is how this works. And I'm just like, and she would just say things to me like, you have a calling on your life. You're a really good writer. You're a really good speaker. You're passionate about the things you believe in. What was if the devil did all this to steal away what you were really truly called to be? And she kept, she didn't have to keep talking to me, but we would talk hours and hours to the point where we would just fall asleep on the phone with each other. And I fell in love with this girl. I fell in love, man. But she she wouldn't she wouldn't date me. She wouldn't. You know, like, I could tell that she had feelings for me, but, like, she's old school holiness, right? Like, she ain't e unequally yoking herself to some some fool, no matter how many uh, NA meetings this dude's going to, right? So I'm like, I got to step up my game, man. Like, I'm like, I'm dating way out of my, I'm, I'm shooting for someone who's way out of my league. So I'm like, I'm going to go to this timeout thing. I'm going to go uh, do whatever I can just to show her that I'm trying to make an effort, you know? 
And I wasn't doing it for the right reasons. And she was smart enough to figure that out because she's the smartest person that I know. But she took it as encouraging and she kept, you know, just wearing away at me. And I remember, like, I was getting to the point where I wanted what she had. I wanted Jesus. But unfortunately, the devil knew that too, you know? And uh, he was hell bent on taking me out. Like, I would just, if I was walking down the street and there was a train coming, I would have to fight the urge not to throw myself in front of that train. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I was standing in a river, I would have to fight the urge not to drown myself. Um, I would have to fight the urge. Like, if I was buttering a piece of toast, man, and I was using a steak knife, or if I was cutting meat, I'd have to fight the urge not to slit my wrists. Like, I was dreaming about hell. I was dreaming about killing myself. Like, I was seeing things in the shadows. Um, it just got to be too much. I, I was about ready to crack. And uh, I remember just being at home. I had skipped school, and I wanted to kill myself. And I was like, today I'm going to kill myself. I can't take this anymore. Like, it's really well and good that everybody's praying for me, but I don't think that God can love me. And I remember, uh, like, I just couldn't do it. Like, I chickened out. Like, I had the instruments of suicide in my hands. And I said, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to watch some TV for a little bit, and then I'll try this again. And I clicked on the TV, and back in the 80s, man, they had these Geraldo Rivera things where he's always fighting and punching out Nazis and the Satanists and trying to figure out what was Al Capone's tomb and Donahue was always you know like oh there's Satanists because like it's the 80s there's the satanic panic going on right everything is like if you have a D&D uh game in your your closet you know like obviously your kids you know worshiping Lucifer you know uh or if he has a Duran Duran album <laughs> like oh man that kid's a homo you know so it's like I didn't, like, there was just so much tabloid stuff. It was super common for people to be interviewing Satanists and all this other stuff. And there was this interview going on with the Satanist on TV, and I just found it by complete random chance. And I'm watching it, and this dude's talking about how he was into Satanism and drugs and drinking and all of this stuff, man, and practicing spells and doing drugs and I'm watching this thing, and I, I can't turn my eyes off. That's my life right up there on the TV screen, bro. And I'm like, what is going on? And then, like, right at the very end of it, he's like, but I found Jesus. Or more importantly, Jesus found me. And I'm no longer what I used to be because who the sun sets free is free indeed. And then it goes into how Jesus delivered him. And saved him. And I'm like, what the heck kind of show am I watching? I didn't know. The testimony stopped, and Pat Robertson is now on the television. Seven Under Club, man. He was younger back then, um, but he was still pretty old. And immediately, I'm looking for my remote control. Because I hate televangelists. I still do. Uh, especially in the 80s, man because they were the ones that were always burning the, the records. And, you know, Jim Baker was like, no. And then he was raping Jessica Hahn and stealing money. And then Jimmy Swaggart was like, oh, that rock and roll's of the devil. And then, like, he would burn all the Ozzy Osbourne stuff. And then, like, what, he started messing around with whores and hookers. And, like, then Ozzy Osbourne writes a song called Miracle Man Got Busted, and he's just, like, talking about Jimmy Swaggart. Like, my friend that we were talking about hated him even worse than I did. He had a, a pet scorpion, uh, and he would feed that scorpion little mice, and he would name the little mice after televangelists. And then, I mean, it was, we really hated him. And I, I was, like, looking for the remote control because I'm turning it off. I'm just like, I don't care how powerful this was. Like, I ain't. I don't have no time for no televangelism. And I remember picking up the remote control, finally finding it. And Pat Robertson goes, you right there, 
thinking about turning the channel, don't do it. This is your moment. Jesus wants to talk to you. Now, I didn't know that he says that all the time. <laughs> that it wasn't really a word of knowledge, you know. <laughs> That's just what he says. But I'd never seen the show, so I was like, whoa, right? And he just starts explaining the gospel. God uses the strangest things. Because he took the thing that I hated the most and still pretty much do. is prosperity, gospel gimmick hours, and stuff like that. And in God's sense of immaculate humor, so that I could not say that I did it myself in any sort of stretch of the imagination, he convicted me of my sins. He showed me in a moment that it didn't matter what I gave the devil. And he, I remember thinking in that moment, it doesn't matter that I sold my soul to the devil because Jesus gave his life for me. And, uh, Man, I gave my heart to Jesus that day, sir. I did. Amen. I'll tell you, man, that's the best decision I ever made in my whole entire life. I get teary every time I think about it, man. Because something legitly happened. A miraculous thing happened that day. Like, I remember, like, no, I didn't see Jesus or have some sort of miraculous encounter or anything crazy. That would come later. But I remember just getting up off that couch and walking towards that telephone to call. The, the girl who would eventually become my wife and tell her what happened. And I remember that short walk from the couch to that phone. I was a new man. I could feel it. I could feel it. I felt like a thousand pounds were just lifted off my soul. And then I started going to that timeout thing more regularly. And one night she's like, would you consider coming to church with me? And, and normally, I wouldn't because, like, growing up strict Lutheran, we weren't allowed to go to other people's churches because that was the devil. Like, there was literally a policy in place that, like, even if you went to a person's wedding or funeral, and it was a different not Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran, you're not even allowed to, like, close your eyes and pray at that because then that's giving consent that you believe in this stuff, right? So, like, I was really, 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 really worried that I would be going to a different church, man. And, uh, but I did because there was a guy there who was a street evangelist. He had came and spoken at the time out. And this guy went down to the, he had a ministry called Heartfire Ministry. And uh, he took a truck down to the inner city uh, at like three o'clock in the morning, two to th his like hours of operation were 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning in, in the ghetto of Milwaukee. And he would take food and Bibles and blankets to like whores, prostitutes, like basically all the drug addicted people, like all the people that churches don't give a rip about. That's where, that's where he was at. And he, when he came to that timeout thing, and this was like right after I got saved, man. And he started sharing his testimony about how God brought him out and brought him to the streets. And I love this dude. I was like, this is my dude, you know? This is my dude. And I was like, man, this is my dude. And my girlfriend, who would become my wife, turns around and says to me, that guy goes to my church. That guy uh, works with, he, he's not the pastor of the church, but he's part of the ministry team of that church. That dude goes to my church. Um, and I'm like, well, now I'm going, now I'm going. And she's like, if you come this Sunday, he's going to be sharing the testimony time at, at the evening. And we had one of those old school assemblies of God churches where, you know, you come during the Sunday morning service and it's you know, normal church service. But then you go to those old school classical Pentecostal churches on Sunday night, 
And those things are like, okay, we're not, no time constraints, no multiple services. This is what it is. They're almost like little mini gospel meetings, right? And so he was going to share like a testimony, his testimony at the church and talk about some of the things that was going on in his ministry. And then the pastor was going to preach and there was going to be music. And I'm like, cool, I'm going to go check this out. Man, I was not ready for what I saw, sir. You got to remember, like I said earlier in the story, our hymnal didn't have Amazing Grace in it, sir, because that was too emotional of a song, right? Like, and this church wasn't singing hill song songs. They were singing old hymns, but the way they sang them, completely different. Um, sang them full of energy, sang them full of love. It was the first time I ever saw people doing one of these in church, dancing a little bit in the spirit. Um, nothing out of order. No one was slain. No one was like running around the church crazy. Like there were no shaking or barking. But this, I freaked. I'm like, did I just, like the only thing I could think of honestly was I saw a documentary on cable about Pentecostals that handled snakes. And it looked like I was looking for snakes. Seriously, I'm like, when are they bringing out the snakes, right? They didn't. They didn't bring out any snakes. But like, that's the only thing I knew. I didn't know. I just thought that they went to a church that had better music or whatever it was, man. I didn't know. And I'm like, but nothing was out of order. Nothing was evil. I didn't feel an evil presence. I just, I was just like, no, this does not fit in my box of who God is, man. And, uh, but I'll tell you something, dude. The church was so awesome. There were young people in the church. There were people my age. There were young kids. There were, you know, adults, parents, moms. There were grandparents. Like, all generations were there just worshiping God. And like when they were singing, you could tell they believed in it. When they sang, there's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb, I believed it, you know? And so he gets up and testifies. Then the pastor gets up and preaches. I've never seen nobody preach like this. This pastor sweating, 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 preaching. And I remember what he preached about, and this is crazy because I was 18 years old. I'm 47 now, so it's been quite a long time. I can tell you the high points and the bullet points of this dude's sermon. Because I've never heard a sermon preached like this before in my life. That dude was preaching about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was preaching about lions and fiery furnaces. He was preaching about a system called Babylon that wanted to put people in chains and, and, and kidnap people and make them bow down to the things of the world that wanted to take those young children and make them serve Baal. And it would have been really easy for them to get along to, to, do, to do it. They could have had all the power. They could have had everything if they just would have eaten off the king's delicacies. I mean, he was preaching this. I didn't even know half this stuff was in the Bible, sir. And then he's like, yeah, man. It would like the music played. And they were standing up like they stood out like sore thumbs because everybody else was bowing. And he's like, God's got to have himself a bunch of sore thumbs somewhere. Someone's got to be a sore thumb for God. Someone's going to want to have to serve God harder than they serve the devil. He's like, there is a young generation of people that have, that have been in chains to Babylon, that have been eating off that Babylonian buffet all their life. They've been playing that music to Baal. They've been bowing down at the altar of that music. They've made idols of not only Satan, but themselves. I mean, this guy's preaching this. And he's like, those people, they're going to encounter God, and they're going to get full of the Holy Ghost, and they're going to serve God harder than they've ever served the devil. And then he just starts screaming, where's Daniel? Where's Shadrach? Where's Meshach? Where's Abednego? And, you know, then it gets apocalyptic, and he's talking about the tribulation and the fire. And, and I'm just like, what did I just walk into, right? But I, and he wasn't being showy, and he wasn't doing it for money. And this dude just believed what he was saying. And he was just preaching my story, man. That's why I remember that sermon, dude, because that, 
legitimately put me on the path that I'm on now. But that's not the crazy part, dude. The crazy part's what happens next. Because after this, it's altar time. And I don't know what altar time is back then, but it's where at the end of the service, they bring the praise band back up which was, I believe, a dude playing guitar, a drummer, a bass player, and an old-school piano. And, they're like, and they just say, hey, if you, if you want to do business with God, you just come up here. And I'm like, I don't know, what's business with God? <laughs> like, is there, I have a punch a clock? I don't know. Like, Christianese, I didn't get it, man. But he's like, you just come to this altar, man, and we'll pray for you. And it wasn't like one of these things where you just line people up, start knocking people down. Back in those days... What they would do is you would come up, you would stand there, they'd let you worship for a little while, and then someone would come and pray with you, or they'd pull you aside to a room and they'd talk to you, or they'd sit down with you on the pew and they, they would counsel you one-on-one -on -one after a time of prayer. And I saw people going down to, to that, that front area that they call the altar. There was not an altar down there, but call it the altar. And I remember everything in my body wanting to run. I wanted to get up, jump up, and run down there. But I was scared, scared, scared. Because I, I didn't know. Like, Lutheran, right? And I wanted to be cool. I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. This was my first time ever, ever being in a date-like environment with this girl. I didn't want her to think I was some sort of crazy person. Like, I just finally went to her church. I wanted to play it cool. So I turned around and I said, hey, can we go? I said, this was really cool. This was, this really touched me, but I'm like, this is just too much. I said, can we just go? And she's like, yeah, yeah, we can go. I was about ready to leave and I felt a tug on my shirt. I looked over and sitting next to me was a little old lady and her husband who was bald, had a goatee, not like this, but like the old person goatee. But man, she was like a frail old lady, but like her husband looked like he could have bench pressed a car. You know what I'm saying? Like, like who is the Mr. Clean over here in his, his 80s, you know? And uh, she looked at me and she's like, son? She called me son. She's like, son? Do not disobey the Holy Ghost. She said, you're supposed to go down there. God loves you. He knows where you're at. And if you don't go, he'll still love you. He understands that you're scared. He won't hold that against you. But he told me to tell you that if you go down there, you'll find what you're looking and it will be worth it. Don't let this blessing pass you by. That was the freakiest thing that happened in my life. Because this lady just read my mail, and I... This wasn't like a Pat Robertson thing where he says it all the time. Like, this lady had a word of knowledge. I didn't know what a word of knowledge was, but she did. And I'm like, what kind of church did I just walk into? They can read minds here, sir. <laughs> like, I'm like, first I hear this message, then the praise, the this. And at that point, I'm just like, I'm going down there. Like, I don't care. And I said, hey, I'm going to go down there. And she's like, yeah, I, I kind of thought you would. And I'm like, all right, so I go down there. I'm by, I'm by myself. And the music just starts playing, and I'm looking around. I don't know what to do. Okay, so now what? I'm here. So what? I'm here looking around, looking around. I see people start raising their hands and they're singing. And I'm like, well, I guess I should raise my hands and sing. Um, so I started raising my hands. I don't remember if I knew the words to the song or not because it didn't really matter. I'm telling you, man. There are very few times in my life that I could feel, that I could say, without being deceptive or showy that I felt the tangible presence of the living God. But that was one of those times. Whew. Like there was nothing out of order going on because I felt like I was standing on holy ground. 
I felt as if I actually remember putting my hands down for a moment because I felt that if I moved, I would offend God. I felt like I had no business being down there. And I'm sorry, every time I share this, I get choked up because in a lot of ways, man, I've been chasing my whole life to get back to this point where I was 18 years ago. It's amazing that God knows your heart because when you just pray simply what's on your heart, he listens. And if you're listening to this testimony tonight, if you take nothing away from everything that I'm sharing tonight, please take this. It's not important how awesome your prayer sounds. It's not important how you pray. It's not important what the words that you use. Like you don't have to be a PhD to pray. You just have to be honest in your heart. Cry out to God. And I remember the prayer I prayed that night. I just said, God, I don't know if this is real or not. I just want what these people have because they have you. And if you give me the power and the passion that these people have, if you give me what they have tonight, I will serve you harder than I ever served the devil. I didn't say it out loud. Maybe I started. I don't know. I know that's what was in my heart. Because honestly, as I was praying it, I felt hands on the back of my neck and on the top of my head, just like my dad used to pray for me. And I know this is going to probably cause some sort of controversy because it doesn't always happen like but I remember trying to pray, and the words I was speaking were clearly not English at that point. And it didn't even freak me out. I didn't, because what I felt in that moment, but the moment that dude put his hands on the back of my head and started praying for me, and he wasn't praying in tongues or anything, he was just praying for me. I felt the power of God come over me. And it's cliche to say that it feels like fire, but it, it does. And uh, I'm not one of these people that say that the initial physical evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. I don't believe that. Not everyone speaks in tongues. The Bible's clear upon that. The Bible also says that he gives it as he will. I believe that sometimes when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. I believe God had to do it that way for me. And like, I'm not, I don't always pray in tongues or speak in tongues unless the Holy Spirit leads me to do that. I don't do it probably as much as I should. But I think he had to do it that way for me because otherwise, how do I know that that wasn't just an experience I had in my head? He was showing me that something unmistakably supernatural happened that I couldn't fake. He was showing me that, and I didn't know it was called, I didn't know I was asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't ask, I didn't know I was asking to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I had no framework of theology for anything that was happening. All I know is that I met God that night, and he gave me exactly what I asked for. And then I remember that missionary, or that street evangelist guy. He was there, he came over, and he pulled me aside, and he sat me down at a pew. And I remember the service letting out, and I remember asking him two questions. What happened to me? And show me in the Bible where this is. I don't know why I asked the second question. I really wanted to know the first one. But there was just something inside of me that said, show me in the Bible. I think that's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Even right then, he had changed me and was at prompting me to ask the most important question. He took me to the book of Acts, and he started showing me 
Exactly. He took me through the whole entire book of Acts. Every time someone got filled with the Holy Spirit, what that was. And then he took me to the thing about the tongues, and he said, you may never speak in tongues again, but you did tonight. Because God wanted to show you that this was real. And I remember just sitting there being like, this is the Bible. This is the God I always wanted to serve, and I finally found him. And I'll tell you, man, I tried really, really hard to keep that promise to God. I went into ministry, went to Bible college. I uh, became a pastor, became an evangelist. Um, I served God really, really hard, sir. I went to the inner city. I patterned a lot of my ministry after a couple of key people, David Wilkerson, uh, Ray, who was the missionary to the people on the streets. Um, I could have had a nice church somewhere in a nicer neighborhood. I purposely uh, went out from a church plant into the inner city because I wanted to reach people in the streets, man. Like, we got a storefront, and man, we did Jesus in that storefront. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we did Jesus on the streets. We did preaching on the streets. We preaching at the rescue missions, like anywhere that would have us, we would preach. And I served God really, 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 really hard. Um, too hard. I burnt myself out. Uh, I let the devil steal some things from me. Uh, my wife went through a very personal tragedy. And I left the ministry because I needed to be there for my wife to help her cope. Her uh, dad committed suicide. And uh, she was struggling, and I had no time for her because literally I was a pastor and I was an evangelist. And I was like 24 7 on the move serving Jesus. Preach this revival, preach this preach thing. Do church, do Bible study. I mean, like, do it all, man. And, like, this is Satan again, dude. Like, he always tries to take you down right before you get into that next level, sir. Um, a lot of my friends, like, now this is, like, right around the time where the new apostolic reformation was beginning to happen. Uh, but they weren't calling it that. It was called the Day of the Saints movement or the Saints movement or the Gospel Mandate, before the Mountain Mandate. Um, there was a dude named Bill Hammond who was a, an apostle and a prophet, supposedly. And a few of the people that I went to Bible school with and that had been part of the same ministry circle that I was part of, got all hooked up in this Bill Hammond guy, and uh, they basically were convinced that they were apostles and prophets. And I trusted part of what they said because, hey, these people were people I knew, trusted, ministered alongside of. And I didn't know what to think, that like they were praying over me, prophesying things over me. They were basically trying to recruit me into their stable, you know? And I almost was NAR which is crazy because I preach against that the hardest of all things that I preach against. And I think God in his mercy allowed me to walk away because I was at that point where do I walk away or do I say this is because they were praying specific prophetic words over me like, no, don't walk away. Join this movement. Like you need to be asking for stadiums and all this other crazy stuff, man. I walked away. Uh, that was God protecting me from joining the brainwashed me and turned me into a zombie. The problem is, is that sometimes God moves you out of the way for a moment to protect you, but you can't stay there. But there are moments where God takes his people and puts them in the wilderness to, uh, preserve them or keep them or to teach them something. 
we all have seasons in our lives, man, where God moves you aside for a moment or takes you out of something that you're passionately into, either protect you or to show you something, but you can't stay there. You can't stay in the wilderness. You can't wander around in it. You can't overstay your welcome. I overstayed. I overstayed, man. I got consumed in just uh, paying the bills and doing the normal thing. Nothing wrong with paying the bills and doing the normal thing. But I overstayed my wilderness time in my faith. Um, I became too careless. I didn't pray as much as I used to. I didn't read my Bible as much as I used to. I uh, started drinking socially again smoking a cigarette every now and once in a while. And you'd say, like, well, it's not wrong to have a drink every once in a while socially, maybe. I mean, I believe there's liberty. It was wrong for me to do it, though, I'll tell you that. This is my past with it. Um, I overstayed in that wilderness, dude. I started drinking again. I started smoking again. I didn't do drugs. But I pretty much was, like, I pretty much walked away from my faith, dude. Like, it was bad. I was starting to uh, believe in something called Asatru, which is like the Nordic religion, right? Like Thor and Odin and Freya and Frigga. And there was this movement called Asatru, and they didn't have Ten Commandments. They had Ten Virtues. And I was like, this makes sense to me. Like, man... It's not about a bunch of laws we can and can't keep. It's about virtues we should ascribe to and fellowship and community. And I don't know why I was thinking what I was thinking. It's probably just because, man, like you give the devil an inch, he'll take you a mile and you won't even know. You know, and yeah, yeah, I was drinking, but it's like you get the devil in the back seat of your car, dude, and after a while he's going to want to drive. Drive you all the way down to the desert and take your life, dude. And it gotten bad. And it got really bad, dude. Um, my my best friend Kurt Kurt Lee. I don't know who he is. If you've watched Omega Frequency, so my best friend. He was worried about me. Uh, I remember going over to his house one day, and I was drunk. Like early in the morning, we were going to go to a local art house film theater and watch, I think it was the girlfriend experience or something. I wouldn't recommend ever watching that. But it was the very first uh, movie ever shot on the red cinema camera. And uh, Kurt had one and he wanted to see what it looked like up on the big screen. And uh, we went and I remember coming over to his house early in the morning because it was my weekend off from work. And I was drinking Rockstar Energy drinks, mixing them with vodka, right? Not a good thing. Especially those green ones, man. Those neon green ones. Like, I was just pounding them. I think before we even made it to the theater around 1 o'clock, I probably... Man, I was probably twice over the legal limit of what I should have been drinking. I wasn't driving. But I remember going to... Uh, we went out to eat. I remember trying to eat food to, like, settle down the alcohol. I remember getting really sick. I remember, like, I don't remember anything about the movie. I remember coming home. I remember drinking more. I remember uh, my friend having a come-to-Jesus moment with me. And he's like, look, dude, enough's enough. I can't be doing this. Like, it's getting out of hand. And I'm like, yeah, probably. And I remember him taking the keys for me, and he's like, I'm driving you home. Like, I'll come pick you up tomorrow. Like, but you're not driving. And I remember getting in the car, so just, I felt like I was going to die, sir. You know, like when you're really drunk and you can't even close your eyes because everything is spinning, and when you hit the bumps in the roads, you feel like you're literally going to throw up a lung. And I remember, uh, we're driving past this Denny's, and I said, bro, I'm going to be sick. And he's like, you're not going to be sick of my car. And he pulls over to the Denny's. We go into the Denny's, and I go to the bathroom. 
I remember closing the stall. I remember puking and puking and puking to the point where my throat felt like I was puking razor blades. And it was just foul, man. It was it was like that brown, almost diarrhea puke. But then there was like green, neon green from the energy drinks too. And it was it was bad. Like I'm pretty sure there was blood. I'm almost positive I was gonna die. I almost felt like my spirit was leaving my body. Real literally. I'm pretty sure I had alcohol poisoning. I'm pretty sure I was gonna die. And the craziest thing ever happened. There was a Huey Lewis in the News song playing over the loudspeakers because it was a restaurant. And it was the song Back in Time from Back to the Future. You know, going to go back in time. And I remember hearing this thing play, and the thought in my head was, great, I am going to die I felt like I was literally, my knees were going to give out, and I was just going to be found hugging a toilet bowl, dead, spirit leaving the body, and the worst of it all would be I'd have to die hearing Huey Lewis of the News play a cheesy 80s song. I'm like, this is no way to go out. I remember being a little mad at the irony of it all. But the three spiritual experiences in my life, man. One was Pat Robertson. One was a proper one in a church. And the other spiritual experience was me in a Denny's bathroom puking out my lungs, listening to Huey Lewis back in time, because I don't know how I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit just straight up told me, you can go back in time. It's not too late to go back in time. Huh? I did. I said, Lord, I don't know if I'm going to live or die, but please forgive me. Please forgive me. I said, I want to go back. I want to go back to the way it was, man. I don't I want to drink anymore. I can't quit again. I'm addicted to this thing. Like, I can't quit smoking. I'm addicted to that. Like, if it's possible, Lord, to go back in time, if you can, if you can save me, do it, Lord, please. And I didn't know in that moment if I was gonna, if this was one of those thieves on the cross situations where I was gonna die, and that I'd make it into to, to heaven by the skin of my teeth and stand before the Lord, the judgment seat, and and you know making it with no awards and just naked. But luckily. Luckily, that wasn't the case, dude. And I remember getting up, just, I felt God in the strangest of all places. And then if you can take a second thing from this testimony is God will meet you in the strangest places if you're hungry for God. I'm telling you, he met me in a stall of a bathroom while Huey Lewis and the news was playing as I was on the ground hugging a toilet bowl, puking out my brains. Because when I woke, when I got up off that, uh, that floor i felt the holy spirit again wasn't as, as tangible as the last time it definitely wasn't a holy ground moment but you can ask kurt next time you see him and he's he's testified to this on some of the shows we've done he said when that when you walked out of that bathroom i could tell there was something different i could tell i'll tell you what man i walked out of that bathroom i never picked up one cigarette again i've never had a drop of alcohol I don't crave it. Like, I don't crave it. Like, God delivered me completely in that moment. And uh, yeah. it, it was a miracle. So, like, if you need a miracle in your life, man, it's not too late to go back in time. Just cry out to God. He's, he's a good, good father. And Jesus is a good, good shepherd, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth and power. And he'll meet you. I took about a year um, of just, at the, after that, man, it was about a year, year and a half, 
where I got really serious about God again. I went back to church. I started praying. I started reading my Bible. I started putting myself back onto a road of restoration, right? I just didn't, like, get up off the bathroom and then start, so I'm going to go back into ministry. No, no, sir. I realized that I needed to uh, make sure that if I would ever do this again, that I was going to come correct because I knew implicitly that in that moment that I got off the ground, God saved me so that I could go back. Like there was no more wilderness, but man, I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't slip again. And so what I did was I just shut myself up with God and started just being a Christian again where no one could see me before I would speak to anyone on a podcast. I would just speak to people in the streets, dude. I would, I would walk around and up Bible tracks, buy people coffee, ask them if I could pray for them, you know, just little things that no one would see. Um, I used to have a shirt and I still wear it from time to time. It's harder to do it when, when everybody's in COVID because no one wants to come and talk to you if you're wearing a mask. That's a whole other subject. But I used to have a shirt that, that I had specially made that said, uh, need prayer? Come talk to me. I'll pray for you. Sit down on the front and the back. And I would just walk around malls and stores with that shirt on. Just walk around, man. And people invariably would come up and say, hey, I could use some prayer. And I'd stop and pray for them. And then Kurt told me, hey, man, like, I want to tell you something. And he's like, we're sitting in a... Applebee's or TGI Fridays, one of those two restaurants. And he basically told me about this thing called podcasting. And he's like, I knew about podcasting. I knew what the Lord was going to do with you a year and a half ago and how he was going to use you. He's like, but I just didn't feel that it was the time to tell you till now. Because he was a good enough friend to know that I needed to get myself back in order. And to not only get myself back in order, but be a man again of God. And then for God to test me in the little things in private. And uh, when I was ready, Kurt told me about podcasting, told me about this vision, not like a spiritual vision, but like this idea, right, for Omega Frequency. We came up with the name. We actually, uh, from that conversation, it was about a year and a half to two years before we actually launched the podcast. In that time, we planned stuff, we prayed about stuff, we worked stuff out. Uh, I took time knowing that this is what we were going to do. I took that year and a half to two years to really, really shore myself up privately and to really, really walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I knew that even though this was a, not a traditional church thing that we were about to embark in, I knew that God was, was in this. That brings me to where we are now, man. Like from podcast to YouTube channel, like that started six years ago. So God's been amazingly awesome. Everything that, you know, people see when they watch Omega Frequency or listen to an Omega Frequency podcast, that's the story behind it. Um, if you take three things, I guess, from this testimony, it would be this, man. We all, we all get passionate. We want to serve God. We want to rush into ministry. And that's great because, like, we're at that moment now where all hands do need to be on deck. There's a harvest out there, man. Um, and it's lacking reapers. It's lacking people to work the harvest. But you have to understand, man, that you still have to be disciplined in what you do if you want to be a worker. And not just to rush into something without, the Bible's really clear about this, man. It's something I've always believed in. The Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly. And that's not talking about praying for someone or anointing someone with oil. That's like ordaining somebody into ministry, man. And I'm not saying that you have to do 10 years of ministry work or whatnot before God can use you. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when you step into the calling and the purpose that God has for your life, the devil always notices and come at you because he don't fight fair. He's going to hit you below the belt. 
He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you don't want to be lunch for the devil, man. And that's why Paul was really, really hesitant about just, yeah, go ahead and do it. Because if you don't have the means to stand against the devil, if you don't have the seasoning, you're going to be free, free lunch, man. He's going to be like a vicious, vicious pit bull, and you're going to be wearing milk bone underwear. You know what I'm saying? Like that's as about as crass as I can be and break it down for people. Like, so the third thing you may take away from this testimony is this, man. Like, yeah, I knew Omega Frequency was going to be what God had called me into the season. Matter of fact, everything that I've ever went through has called me for this moment. Um, but even before I got on the microphone and said one word, man, I had to take time. It took about a year and a half to two years before I even said a word. Because I did not want to fail again. So take your calling very seriously. Ask for the power and endowment to get it done. And and take it seriously, man. And, and like some, I, you know, we're getting to that point too where Jesus is, you know, like, I'll close with this, man. Jesus has that awesome parable about the laborers in the harvest field. And at the beginning of the day, he goes out and he hires the people that are seasoned, the generals of our faith, right? And he hires them to go work in the field. But man, the job's just, it's too big. And even all the people that, that are out in the field know how to work it. They're experienced. They're good. Like, they're just, they're just too much. So the master's like, I got to go out, man. So a few hours later, he goes out and he, you know, maybe goes down to the equivalent of the Home Depot and finds some people hanging out in front of the thing and said, these guys may not be as talented as the people that I hired, but like, they'll know how to get the job done. So he brings those people in and they start getting the job done. And he does this a couple of other times. And gets to the last couple hours, the last hour of the harvest, and, like, this harvest has got to be brought in because, like, nature doesn't give a darn. When it's time, it's done. Like, you can't cheat nature. You either bring in that harvest on time or there's going to be stuff that spoils in the field, right? Like, you can't just be like, well, maybe we'll just try again tomorrow. No. And it's the same thing coming about the end of the age. There's definitely a an ending point around the corner. And then at the end of it, it's the end, dude. And there ain't going to be whatever's left in the fields in the field, man. And you don't want to be that way when Jesus comes back. Because those are the people that are going to be running, crying, hide, hide me, hide me. So the master says, well, there's only about an hour of daylight left, but man, final push. We got to get everything done that we need to get done. He goes out into the marketplace and he finds people standing around. I don't have the skills. And he's like, hey, why are you guys standing around? And they say, because no one will hire us. Right? No one will hire us. This me, you know, okay. you know, like we're not hireable because we don't know anything about the harvesting. We're not, we're not the qualified. We're not the best educated. We, we would come and work for you, but no one will hire us. We're the dregs. We're, we're, we're the, the ones they've counted out. And he's like, hey, man, come work. Implicit in this is this. If Jesus is hiring a bunch of people at the last hour that no one else will hire because they don't have the skills and because the religious world has passed over them and the litany number of reasons why these people aren't qualified, they go into the field never having done this before. And you got to have tools, dude, right? Got to have tools, instruments. They didn't have those. I'm pretty sure that the first people that he came and hired had tools because they were probably tradesmen of harvesting. But it's okay because the master of the harvest probably had to give them the tools they were using. I'm telling you, man, you know what, what gets BDK fired up to do what he does? 
says, I believe we're at the last prophetic hour of human history. And I believe that the generals are still in the field. I believe that all of these people are in the field. Like the generals, they get mad because they're all like, man, I've been doing this forever. And these, these people that nobody else would employ, they get to come in at this last hour. They get to use your tools and they're getting paid the same as me. Like, I don't look at it that way. I'm telling you, man. There's a generation that nobody wants walking around the streets right now that the Christian church has no desire to reach or win because they see that these people have no value in their mind. No one will hire them. Jesus is coming soon. He'll hire you. And not only will he hire you, he'll give you the tools to get this done. He'll give you the Holy Ghost if you but ask. I'm telling you right now, if you're sitting out there and you're like, man, I should be busy for the Lord, but no one will hire me. I'm telling you, sir. Pray a prayer like this. Jesus, if you give me the tools, I'll serve you harder than I've ever served the devil. And you pray that today, man. And you'll see. You may not be able to just rush into the, the battle. You may have to, like, find someone to help disciple you for a little bit. But, man, even if you're not stepping into some sort of ministry thing, like, you can still give out your Bible tracts. You can still buy someone a cup of coffee and say, Jesus loves you. And you can still pray and believe. Like, there's a lot of things we can get done, and I, I believe something that David Wilkerson used to say all the time. This is why I don't, I don't worry about no pre-trib rapture shenanigans. I don't believe in that. I don't believe there's a need for it. David Wilkerson used to say all the time, in the world's darkest hour, that's when God's going to display his greatest power. I'm not talking about a new apostolic reformation revival. I'm talking about this generation that everyone said no one's going to hire, joining us. And generals out there, people, you've been in this working field, and you got the gray in your beard too, man. Don't despise our younger brethren. Help them. Be an encouragement to them. Build them up. You need them. They understand things about this world that we don't even understand. 